All right, so in this chapter, we're going to look at three Islamic empires, the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughal Empire. So all three are Islamic, and all three are what we call gunpowder empires, which is exactly what it sounds like, by the way. So the first one we're going to look at is the Ottoman Turks, which have a huge impact on European history and the history of the New World, and of course, the history of Asia, where they started. And so if you're taking notes because you're absent in class, you're going to hit the pause button right here so you can write all of this down, all these locations. And in just a second, I'm going to put a map on the screen. It's going to cover them up so you can see where all these locations are. So the Ottoman Turks, they got their start on the Anatolian Peninsula, where modern-day Turkey is today. That's why Turkey is called Turkey. Right? It's named after the ethnic group, the Turks, right? the Ottoman Turks. So they started on the Anatolian Peninsula, and then they began to grow and grow and grow as kingdoms around them became weaker and weaker and weaker. So eventually they controlled the Bosphorus, which gave them uh, access to the Black Sea. And eventually they also controlled the Dardanelles, which gave them access to the Aegean Sea. Right? So they can completely control the Sea of Marmara now. Control access to the Black Sea, control access to the Aegean Sea. And with both of these, particularly the Bosphorus, they are now easily able to get into Europe, which they begin to slowly take over parts of Eastern Europe, particularly an area of Eastern Europe called the Balkans in Southeastern Europe. It's where modern day Serbia is, and Bosnia, and Croatia. And in fact, if you visit this part of Europe today, along with a Christian population, you will find a Islamic population as well. This is why. And so the Balkans was really important, not just, not just because it gives them a toehold in Europe, but also it's because where they will get their janissaries. Right? So the Ottomans are a gunpowder empire, an empire formed by outside conquerors that have mastered the use of firearms, gunpowder. And the janissaries were highly trained soldiers, the elite guard of the Ottoman Empire. See, in the Islamic world, it was forbidden for Muslims to enslave other Muslims. But it was not forbidden for Muslims to enslave Christians. So when the Ottomans conquered the Balkans, they began to enslave Christian boys in the Balkans and at a very young age, then train them to become soldiers, janissaries. Right? Uh, and and I know slavery, of course, is bad, and a lot of times your mind automatically goes to the worst-case scenario, but actually some parents in the Balkans volunteered their sons for uh, th th this cause to become Janissaries because the Janissaries actually lived a pretty good life. I mean, training was hard at first, but if you made it through the training, you could end up with a very high position within the Ottoman Empire. So on a regular basis, on an annual basis, the Ottomans would demand boys from the Balkans. And as I said, sometimes parents would volunteer their sons because their sons would end up with a better life than if they stayed in the Balkans as a poor farmer. Right? And so these become the elite guard. Eventually, they'll become so powerful that near the end of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Ottoman Turks are going to have to end the Janissaries. They, they become too powerful. But that's way down the road. That's centuries down the road. So the Ottomans, right, they control all of this great geography. Location, location, location. They control the Anatolian Peninsula, the Bosphorus, the Dardanelles, the Sea of Marmara. Right? They've conquered the Balkans, which gives them uh, a source of Janissaries. But there is a problem which this man is going to solve, Mehmet II. In the Ottoman Empire, when you became sultan, you were expected to conquer. Particularly in the early days of the Ottoman Empire, those first few centuries, you were expected to conquer. That's how you prove to your people that you were supposed to be in charge. Because the way it works in the Ottoman Empire, it's not like in Europe. The eldest son did not always become the next sultan, the next ruler. It was uh, given to him by his father, and sometimes even that didn't work. Uh, it ended up becoming survival of the fittest, where the sons would fight each other to take charge. So you had to prove yourselves to the people. You didn't just naturally inherit the throne. You had to prove that you deserved to be there. So Mehmet II, right, he wanted to do something no Ottoman Turk had ever done. Conquer Constantinople. Everything in orange there already belonged to the Ottoman Turks. Right in the center, there was Constantinople, the capital of what was left of the Christian Byzantine 
Empire. And Constantinople, the walls of Constantinople had never fallen. And notice this dead center right in the middle of the empire. Think about how frustrating that is for Mehmet II. And he wants it. He is going to get it. Now, it's going to be difficult. Right? So, what he does, right, is he, he he builds a bridge across the Bosphorus to get soldiers, right, into the Bosphorus to where Constantinople is. But even that, that's not enough. So on the screen here is a map of Constantinople. And it had these huge walls, right, uh, walls that were so wide that four soldiers could ride on horseback across them, right? Huge, gigantic walls that had never fallen. There were also walls all along the seacoast as well and they and, and when they were under siege the Ottomans also would drag a, a chain across what was called the golden horn there to form a, a barrier so Mehmet the second he's got a huge task in front of him he's got an ace up his sleeve though he's a gun powder empire right so he has cannons this is a replica of one of the cannons he had the biggest cannon that he had that was over 20 feet long and could shoot cannonballs 600 pounds, almost a mile, right? Then you had hundreds of smaller cannons. Imagine the psychological impact of seeing that massive cannon brought before your walls. And then also, because he was determined, if you look uh, at a place called Pera, just north of that, you're going to see an arrow, right? Uh, and, of course, it's in French because it's the best map I could find. Uh, it says Trage de Nevris Allais, right? And that arrow, that's where the Ottomans actually carried, pulled uh, across Greece logs, pulled part of their navy across land to get around that chain. That's why those red ships, those are actually Ottoman ships there. So they actually go around the, the, the chain there, they, they take para, right, and then the guns begin to fire at the walls. It takes six weeks of constant bombardment, but eventually the wall collapses, and the Ottomans take Constantinople, and the Byzantine Empire, the Christian Byzantine Empire that had stood 1,500 years, was now no more, and Mehmet makes this great city the new capital, renames it Istanbul. Istanbul, that will be on your test. Right? Huge blow to the Christian psyche of Europe that this great Christian city had fell to Islamic invaders. Had a huge impact, right? Because many in Constantinople, many Christians fled and they brought their knowledge with them. They brought it to places like Italy and helped to trigger the Renaissance. Also, the Ottomans are going to get in the way of the spice trade. So Europeans are going to want to find a water route to Asia, sparking the age of exploration. See, everything's connected. A following sultan was a guy named Sultan Selim I. He takes over Egypt, Arabia, and Mesopotamia. This is important not only because it makes the empire bigger, but by conquering Arabia, the Ottomans now control the three sacred cities of Islam, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. There's bragging rights involved in that with other Islamic empires. Also, if you control Mecca, remember, in Islam, you're supposed to travel at least once to Mecca in your life if you are physically and financially capable of it. And there's a lot of money to be had in tourism, in controlling that sacred site. So this was a big deal for the Ottomans. Eventually, they take over North Africa as well. And, and the empire gets so big, right, it becomes hard to rule. So what they do is they appoint pashas, bureaucrats, government officials to run the empire for them. They would divide it up into territories, and pashas would run each territory, and the pashas would report back to the Ottoman emperor. And if a pasha didn't do his job, uh, particularly if he was caught stealing from the empire, they would execute him. And what the Ottomans did was pretty smart. When they conquered an area, they would try to recruit their pashas from the people that they conquered. Because those people already know the language and the culture and the ins and outs. It was exactly what the Roman Empire did. Conquer, then recruit the people you conquered to help run your empire. You might be thinking to yourself, well, why would you help them? They just conquered you. Because the, being a pasha is a pretty sweet gig. You have power, you have influence, you could have wealth. As long as you did your job well, you collected your taxes, you enforced the laws, and you weren't corrupt. This was a really good system. It served the Ottomans just like it served the Romans very well. 
Now we come to Suleiman. We're going to talk about Suleiman off and on in this section. Suleiman the Magnificent. Suleiman the Lawgiver. Suleiman of the Giant Turban, as you can see on the screen there. Suleiman, right? He too expands the empire, of course. He too imposes law and order, hence his nickname, the Lawgiver. Uh, sometimes it's called Suleiman the Magnificent, even by his rival, the Europeans. And he makes the empire bigger as well. He actually conquers Hungary. He actually makes it as far as Vienna in Austria. But the Europeans freak out, put aside their differences to stop him at Vienna in Austria. And he's actually going to be the last truly great sultan, ruler of the Ottoman Empire. 